Hey, this is Brock Palin from Advanced Research Computing Technology Services at the University of Michigan. Uh, this is a quick demo of some work we've been doing as we're trying to learn how to automate things in the cloud. In this case, we chose to use uh, HashiCorp's Terraform, which is an open source tool that lets you to, uh, it's pretty cloud agnostic. It has providers for Amazon, Google, uh, uh, OpenStack, VMware, uh, um, Microsoft Azure. It supports pretty much everything as well as support for things like dynamic DNS, uh, Kubernetes, Docker, other, other things like that. So in this case, uh, this is all out on GitHub. Uh, you can find it on my personal GitHub. It's, it, you know, if, if we continue this project, it'll probably convert over to the RTS official GitHub. Um, but there's examples here about how to set up an environment to set up Jupyter Hub on Google currently, um, but it's very easy to switch this over to use something else because it's really Jupyter Hub on Docker on Kubernetes. Uh, so I, I've, I've set up an, an, an uh, environment, but it comes with an examples one where you put in things like your OAuth secrets and your Google credentials, and your SSL certificates, things like that. And you can also set up your Jupyter Hub config file, um, which lets you specify things like, uh, you know, what container you want to actually start up, which could include specialty software like Julia support or notebooks you want to use for a specific class. So what's nice about this is, is you can actually just run Terraform plan on a, a, a file and it tells you like, okay, I, I don't have anything created. It's going to create 16 new resources, which includes things like my Kubernetes cluster, um, but it also keeps track of things. So if I go ahead and uh, apply this, it was going to talk to Google, find out what it has, compares it against what I want the state to be, and it's going to make those changes. So if I wanted to, say, update the image, that is, I want to point to a new Jupyter um, Hub instance that has new software installed, I can point it at it, and it will automatically be like, hey, you know, I already have Kubernetes deployed. What I actually need to do is, is I need to change this from config option, and you say change. Uh, sometimes you need to force something to be destroyed and recreated, and you can do that too. There's a command called taint. Um, and that's all documented in there. And this is more something that like us at ArcTS and the research support groups that we work with around campus and all the major schools and colleges, as well as many of the others, uh, where we can help you in your coursework. But what those sets you do is, is you can, for a class, deploy Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes. Now, why do we want to deploy Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes? The primary reason is, is that it's infinitely scalable. So what will happen here is we'll start a Jupyter Hub, which will run on a very small number of resources. It will have a Kubernetes cluster that will have some resources associated with it. And every time a student or a user logs in, and they do this, in, in this setup we use uh, Globus OAuth, which allows us to use our regular university login. So we don't have to worry about uh, people typing in their password to software running out in the cloud. It, it redirects you to our own login on campus, and thus the security responsibility is kind of outsourced to our normal campus IP, and thus we don't have to worry about that as much. Uh, require things like two-factor authentication that that all exists also when you see that in a moment. Um, now setting this whole thing up, I'm starting from nothing. Uh, I'm going to edit, you know, the time out here, but it takes about 10 minutes the first time. A lot of times starting the first container is very slow, but then Google will cache everything. So every time a student logs in, they actually get their own little image running Jupyter. Now what's that actually mean? If you were to put an image in that had a bunch of example notebooks and students started editing them, and saving them, they would actually all isolate from each other. Now, there's ways to change that so that they can you know, be persistent with doing stuff. Um, but not only are they isolated, but they're completely independent, and you get to tell them, like, I want you to have up to a half a CPU and a gigabyte of memory. Um, and you can crank this up, or if we're doing machine learning, we can change the instance type that we're pointing to. We could be pointing to an instance with a GPU for high power machine learning. Uh, these are all optional things, um, and we can change these as needed. Uh, but other than that, you know, it's it's mostly just ease of use and the fact that on Google Cloud, as more and more students log in, they each get their half a processor, two processors, processor and a GPU, and a gig of memory. Um, it just keeps scaling out, and that's how this is much more scalable than if I ran this on a single server. If you had a course with like 200 students and they're all in lab and they're all trying to log in, that server's going to get completely overloaded. And you're going to have to get other servers and you're going to upset setting up Docker Swarm or one of the other distributed uh, Jupyter Hub spawners, or you're going to end up handling you know, many, many, many independent Jupyter instances if you're not using Jupyter Hub. Uh, but what happens here instead is, is you can 
turn them off. In fact, uh, we're adding functionality that as these notebooks go idle, we actually reap them. That is, we shut them down and we actually reduce the number of resources we're running on Google. And thus, the build is really, really small. Uh, by doing this, as like we can scale up very, very quickly. Um, it just spins more and more machines. You know, we just, as soon as log in and we run out of resources, it automatically adds them. And then as they go idle, the intent is, is that we will shrink back down to the appropriate size. This really helps us control costs and deal with the scalability. So there's a lot of work we still need to do here. Um, we're working with groups like LSA and uh, DCO in the College of Engineering to add more functionality to this. Um, we're also working with Zero to Jupyter Hub, which is what a lot of this is based on, which is based off of Helm charts. Helm is a templating language for uh, Kubernetes, for lack of a better description. Um, I find Terraform a little bit nicer because it deals with my Kubernetes setup and other things. Also, uh, there's actually no reason you couldn't combine them. Um, it just doesn't make it be this one command to start absolutely everything all at once. So you can pretty much set it up any way you want. Okay, so it's completed applying. I've cut out the amount of time it took completely, but it took about seven, eight, nine minutes to do this. You can see here, we even set up a DNS name. In this case, uh, we're using an example we did for Dr. Rod Rao uh, over in ECE, uh, but Google assigned an IP address and you know this changes, but we're also able to control DNS zones through Terraform. So it applied completely everything. But if you want to, um, we actually have it set up that it actually gives you the IP address that the service is running at. So now that I have this running, if I look inside my um, Kubernetes engine on Google Cloud, and again, this could be on one of the other cloud providers, and a lot of this work is uh, mungeable between them. You see that I have a Kubernetes cluster um, that has three nodes and so many processors in memory. And then I have this Jupyter Notebook, which is actually Jupyter Hub. Uh, this is the default name it uses. We can change this, we just haven't yet. Um, but it's a default name. And we have another one that is for sharing data between notebooks. But watch what happens when I actually go to uh, this address here that was set up. It actually, this is the normal Jupyter Hub login. In this case, we've got it set up to use OAuth with Globus. And uh, we just click that. I'm already logged into Globus. Um, and so this is what a student's experience would be if they're already logged in. Uh, um, they, they would just hit start my server. Uh, and this will take a little while because again, the first time it takes a little bit. Uh, but if I look over here and I refresh these workloads on Google, you'll see that there's this Jupyter Dash property and this container is creating. Uh, we can actually look at logs for each of these independently, but this is what happens. Every student will get their own little instance here. And we can tell this and there's options in the config file to say, hey, here's, the container I want you to start. In this case, we're using the default uh, Jupyter Hub single user container. But we could build off of this and add our own code, add our own kernels, add our own functionality and images. Uh, we have complete access to the logs, again, on a per container basis. So this container hasn't started yet, so it's, it's not completely in there yet. Um, but we can also connect to it using kube control here, uh, which you can do, again, on pretty much all the major cloud providers. Uh, we can see the CPU request, CPU limit. Uh, so this container actually has a given amount of processors. In this case, it's getting a one gigabyte of memory and a half of a processor. Um, and there's ways to kind of set minimums and maximums so you can actually kind of have them share. So uh, you can kind of overlap and not have it be a hard allocation. Uh, but once this starts up, um, you can see I'm actually inside my Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so I can go ahead. Creating a notebook, again, it's a default one, so I just have Python 3, um, and I can do whatever I, whatever I want, um, normal. Um, so, um, yeah, that's pretty much how this works. Uh, they completely get their own little independent environment, um, and yeah, they're, they're just running here. So what does this look like when they log in, like a completely fresh when not logged in? So in this case, uh, I'm going to start up a uh, private window um, in Chrome, uh, which forces the logins to change. So here it still takes me, sign in with Globus. 
Uh, what this will do is it'll take me to the Globus login. But you can see here, select your organization. Now notice, it automatically populates it with University of Michigan, but we're actually part of this large academic scientific identity environment called CI login or Cyber Infrastructure Login. And we can actually change this so that we can support other institutions. Uh, so this is very portable across things. And so when the OAuth is set up, you say what default one you want it to show, or you can actually not have it have a default and you pick whatever one you want. Uh, we haven't tested a lot of that functionality yet, um, and you can also, in theory, use um, OpenID with Google or Orchid. But let's click Continue, um, and it takes me to the login for that school. So you can see here, this is our normal university login. And again, we're not maintaining this, so the security and all of that is completely outsourced. Uh, my account requires two-factor authentication, so my phone dings. I go ahead. I approve it. Um, it says successful, and now we're back in, and watch this. Um, it logged me straight in because my uh, instance is already running um, and there is that original notebook that I never actually saved, um, but it's it's there. So that's everything. Um, so now if I want to tear this whole thing down, uh, again, I go back to my Terraform um, and I actually just run this command with the variables and I say destroy. Um, and so what this is going to do, again, Terraform is going to talk to Kubernetes and Google and all the different resources we set up. Um, and it's going to refresh their state, find out where they are, and say, hey, I'm going to destroy 16 things. I say yes, and it will walk through. If it encounters an error, it will stop, but you can run it again. A lot of times, the different cloud providers, their APIs time out, especially when you're doing something automated and you're hitting your APIs really, really hard, um, rather than the amount of time it takes you to click, 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 um, and possibly introduce an error where you forget a step. Um, this gives you a complete definition in a script. So when everything is set up for your course, you should just be able to do apply, and destroy. Maybe you change some config options to change the amount of processor and memory per student, and then you do a new apply in which it will update the Jupyter Hub configuration and say, hey, uh, give this now. So th that's everything. If you have any questions, contact us. Uh, HPC-support at umich.edu is the best place to get a hold of us. Uh, and we have lots and lots of other things that we're doing in the cloud. This was just a simple example of how to use the cloud to deploy things like uh, Jupyter Hub at scale for teaching and research um, and contact us if you want or are interested in using this. Thanks.